Okay, uh, I've got four o'clock on my clock, so uh, I guess I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, thank you very much, first of all, everyone for coming. Uh, this is it's not quite the last slot, is it? It's almost the last slot, so um, I know everyone's tired. And um, anyway, thank you, thank you for uh, for sticking around to to listen to me talk today. It's a pleasure to be here and be able to talk to you. Um, uh, my name is Mark James, um, and I'm an associate professor of applied linguistics at Arizona State University. And today I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes um, about recent work that I've been doing on learning transfer in EAP education. And we'll have some time then for questions. I don't have a handout, um, but I'm going to post my slides and a recording of this presentation, um, an audio recording um, on my website. And the address is right there at the bottom of the screen. So feel free to visit that if you want to uh, listen to the presentation again um, or take a look at the, at the slides. And also, if after today's presentation you are interested in learning um, any more about this project, um, this is actually going to be, there's, there's going to be a detailed description of this in the upcoming um, June issue of the Journal of English for Academic Purposes. Um, so um, if you want more details about this, you can see, you can see it there. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. If we don't get to them during the question and answer part of the presentation, um, please feel free to use my email address and uh, send me any questions that you might have. OK. So uh, to begin, the context that we're focusing on here is EAP education, English for Academic Purposes Education, which is the branch of TESOL that aims to help English learners to participate um, in English medium academic programs. For example, helping English learners who are studying in K through 12 schools, colleges, and universities. So EAP students have a relatively immediate, concrete need to apply what they learn because they have to use English to get through these academic programs. This need to apply learning means that in EAP education, a major concern is learning transfer. Learning transfer is the application of previous learning in new situations. And a general example is how knowing how to play the guitar may help someone who's learning how to play the violin. Or how learning math in school might help someone who's out shopping. Learning transfer is important in all formal education because there's an expectation that whatever students learn in a classroom will help them beyond that classroom. For example, in other classes or outside school, like at home or in the workplace. In other words, there's an expectation that education will result in learning transfer. And EAP education is no different. There's an expectation that EAP instruction will lead to learning that transfers to students' work in their academic programs. But promoting transfer of learning in EAP instruction uh, is a major challenge. There's been a century's worth of research on learning transfer, mainly in psychology, education, and workplace training. And this research shows that when people learn something, that learning doesn't inevitably transfer. And transfer can actually be difficult to stimulate. So just because EAP instruction leads to learning, it doesn't mean that that will necessarily lead to transfer of that learning. But despite this challenge, there is evidence that students do transfer learning from EAP instruction to work in other courses. And this comes from studies done in a range of EAP contexts, including colleges and universities in Australia, Bahrain, Canada, New Zealand, and here in the US. There's a problem, though. Although this research shows that EAP learning can transfer, there's not much detail about the transfer that can occur. For example, some studies have showed that EAP instruction had a positive impact on students' grades in other courses. And this impact on grades suggests that something transferred from EAP instruction to other courses. But in these studies, it's not clear what transferred. Other studies have provided more detail about the kinds of learning that can transfer. And it includes, for example, 
um, reading and writing, listening, speaking, and study skills. But there's typically a lack of any other detail about transfer. For example, what impact transfer had, or whether it occurred in situations that were similar to the EAP instruction or different from the EAP instruction. That lack of detail is important because with EAP instruction, the academic contexts that we expect learning to transfer to are usually complex. There are various kinds of activities dealing with diverse topics from a range of disciplines and shifting places and people in terms of new classrooms, buildings, classmates, and teachers. And that means the transfer we expect might at times be to situations that are very similar to EAP instruction, but it might at other times be to situations that are very different from EAP instruction. And the lack of detail is important also because with EAP instruction, the learning transfer that we expect is itself complex. Various kinds of learning could transfer from EAP instruction, like strategies for listening or reading, or rules for making sentences or paragraphs, or meanings of words. And this transfer could have different kinds of impacts in other courses, like higher grades or faster work. And this transfer may, in some cases, be relatively demanding. For example, when an activity gives no explicit clues that might prompt transfer. But it may, in other cases, be relatively less demanding if an activity does include explicit clues or hints or instructions that prompt transfer. So to summarize the background information, while we know that transfer is important with EAP instruction, and research suggests that such transfer can occur, we don't know much about the circumstances of this transfer. Given the complexity of academic contexts, a clearer picture of transfer will be helpful. For example, for making predictions in the future about where EAP learning transfer may or may not occur. So with that in mind, the purpose of the project that I'm describing uh, here today was to generate a clearer picture of learning transfer in EAP contexts. So how did I go about that? Basically, I found a way to do a detailed analysis of existing research on EAP instruction in a, in a way that would reveal relevant patterns about transfer. So I'll spend a few minutes now describing what I did, and then I'll describe the patterns that I found. Um, first, this analysis involved using an analytic tool called the transfer taxonomy, which was developed about 10 years ago by a pair of transfer researchers in psychology. The psychology research on transfer is massive, and it's filled with complicated findings, with some studies reporting that learning transfers in some contexts, some studies reporting that learning transfers in other contexts, and some studies reporting that little, <coughs> little if any, learning transfers. But this body of research has looked for transfer of lots of different kinds of learning and in lots of different kinds of contexts. So it's been difficult to see important patterns. So to try to bring some clarity to this picture, Barnett and Sessi, the researchers cited here, in 2002 developed the transfer taxonomy so they could examine the existing research and identify important details so that it would be easier to see patterns across these studies. And in that paper, they uh, demonstrated the transfer taxonomy by analyzing a collection of 14 well-known transfer studies. This demonstration was successful in bringing out some interesting patterns. For example, although those 14 studies all stated that they were examining transfer, nine of the 14 studies had looked at transfer in a unique way, looking at it um, in, a, in a context that was different from the contexts that the other studies were looking at. So the majority of them looked at it in a unique way, which makes it difficult to, to, to compare across these findings. So what does the transfer taxonomy look like? Um, it's basically just a nine-dimension framework that you can use as a lens to look at any individual study of transfer. 
So if, for example, you find a study that has reported transfer, you can see where that transfer fits on each of the nine dimensions. And then you'll be able to make comparisons with other studies that have reported transfer to see if what they observed was the same thing or if it was actually something different. So this is the taxonomy, and I'll take a little time here to describe each of the nine dimensions. The first three dimensions of the taxonomy uh, deal with the kind of learning transfer. The first of those dimensions is specificity, because learning transfer is, in some cases, relatively narrow and superficial, like specific facts or concrete step-by-step -step procedures. And in other cases, it's deeper and more general, like abstract principles. And that's an important distinction to make because these different kinds of transfer can occur in different ways. So transfer of specific facts or concrete step-by-step -step procedures can depend on superficial similarities between situations. And it can be unconscious. On the other hand, transfer of abstract principles is more conscious and effortful. And so it may not depend so much on similarities between situations. So it can occur between situations that are very different. The second dimension is performance change, because learning transfer is, in some cases, seen through an improvement in the accuracy or quality of someone's performance. Or it may be seen through an increase in the speed of someone's performance. Or it may be seen through just some kind of change in the way someone approaches a performance without any uh, corresponding change in accuracy or speed. Now that's an, that's an important distinction to make because transfer might lead to one kind of performance change but not another. So depending on the kind of performance change we look for, we may come to different conclusions about whether transfer has occurred in a particular situation. The third dimension is memory demands, because in some cases, transfer places relatively little demand on a person's memory. But in other cases, transfer places much more demand on a person's memory. Um, there's relatively little demand, for example, when someone is given explicit hints or instructions about what to transfer. And there's more demand when there aren't any explicit hints or instructions. So transfer has to be more spontaneous. This is a, an important distinction as well because um, spontaneous transfer is much more difficult. So that's the first three dimensions. The remaining six dimensions focus on transfer distance, which is about the, uh, the, deg the degree of similarity between learning and transfer situations. If the situations are similar, any transfer that occurs can be called near transfer. And if the situations are different, any transfer that occurs can be called far transfer. And it's important to be aware of this distinction because far transfer is usually um, more difficult than near transfer. So the way the transfer taxonomy takes note of transfer distance is along these six dimensions at the bottom of the screen. First, the knowledge, do uh, the knowledge domain, which means whether the learning and transfer activities deal with similar topics. For example, if learning activities focus on chemistry and transfer activities focus on psychology, any transfer that occurs could be considered far transfer on this dimension. Second, physical context, which means whether learning and transfer activities are in the same place and involve the same people. If the places and people are the same, any transfer that occurs is near transfer. But if the people and places are different, any transfer that occurs can be considered far transfer. Third is the temporal context, which means uh, whether learning and transfer activities occur around the same time. Fourth, functional context, which means whether learning and transfer activities have similar purposes. For example, to get grades or to make friends, more of a social purpose. Uh, fifth, social context, which means whether learning and transfer activities are, for example, all collaborative or all individual. And the sixth and final one, modality, 
which means whether learning and transfer activities have similar format. For example, multiple choice or essay. So that's what the transfer taxonomy looks like. And to illustrate it, let's walk through an example of how it was originally used um, outside, outside EAP education to analyze studies of transfer in educational psychology. Here's one of the studies that Barnett and Sessi, who created the transfer taxonomy, uh, analyzed to demonstrate how it could be used. This was a study of elementary school students' transfer of an ability to design science experiments. They were taught how to design science experiments. They wanted to see if they could transfer that ability. So it's in the area of science education. After a pretest, students learned how to design science experiments through a combination of direct instruction and hands-on activities. For example, um, they were comparing springs of different sizes to see uh, what variables influence how far springs will stretch. These students significantly improved their performance from pre-test to post-test, and the researchers claimed that this was an example of learning transfer. So we can use the transfer taxonomy to draw out the important details of this study. First, the transfer involved knowledge of a strategy for designing science experiments. So that's a relatively general kind of learning transfer. Second, the transfer involved using a correct um, design for a science experiment. So that's looking at transfer as an improvement in accuracy or quality of performance. Third, the transfer involved the students looking at descriptions of experimental designs and deciding if they were good or not. This is providing explicit hints to the students that they should be remembering something, something about designing science experiments. So this transfer can be seen as placing low demands on memory. And for the remaining six dimensions uh, that focus on transfer distance, this study was as follows. For knowledge domain, it can, be, it can be considered far because the learning material involved designing science experiments, for example, about mechanics, but the testing material included designing experiments about everyday situations like cooking. For the physical context, it can be considered near transfer because learning and testing both occurred at school. For the temporal context, it can be considered far, because testing occurred seven months after learning. For the functional context, it can be considered near, because learning and testing were both academic, for, for an academic purpose. Um, for social context, it can be considered near, because the learning and testing were both done individually. And for modality, it can be considered far, because learning involved hands-on activities to design science experiments, like stretching springs, but the testing involved a paper and pencil, uh, paper and pencil test, uh, in which students had to look at descriptions of science experiments and decide if they were good or not. So that's what the transfer, ta transfer taxonomy looks like, and an example, uh, and an example of how it has been used outside EAP education. So my thinking was that because the transfer taxonomy had been used successfully outside EAP education to analyze a collection of well-known studies of transfer, it could be useful for shedding light on transfer in EAP education. So my next step was to find a collection of studies that I could examine with the transfer taxonomy. I considered using the transfer taxonomy to examine the EAP studies that I mentioned earlier. That, that had provided evidence of transfer from EAP instruction specifically to students' other courses. But as I said earlier, those studies lack much of the detail that the, ta that the taxonomy would focus on. For example, studies that show that EAP instruction has an impact on students' grades in other courses, those studies lack information about the kind of learning transfer and about transfer distance. And other studies uh, have information about the kind of learning transfer from EAP instruction to other courses, but they lack information about transfer distance. So analyzing those studies with the transfer taxonomy would not work. But there is another collection of studies of EAP education that the transfer taxonomy can be used to analyze. These are studies that have provided evidence of EAP instruction leading to transfer but it's transfer across activities rather than transfer across courses. 
These studies typically don't use the label transfer for what they focus on and instead are seen as focusing on learning. But a close look shows that what they are examining is actually transfer. A typical design involves exposing students to some kind of instructional treatment, like an innovative way of teaching vocabulary or grammar, and then giving students a test to see what they learned. Successful performance on the test requires that the students apply what they learned during the instructional treatment that application can be seen as a case of a transfer. For example, in one study, Halenko and Jones, up on the screen here, examined the impact of English instruction for non-native speakers of English studying at a university in the UK. The students were in two EAP classes. One class participated in six hours of instruction on strategies for making appropriate requests in academic contexts. For example, uh, how to ask for help in a library. The other class did not receive this six hours of instruction. The classes were given, both classes were given a discourse completion test before and again after that six hour period of instruction. These, these uh, tests required students to read brief descriptions of several scenarios and for each one to write a question that they would ask if they were in that scenario. The results showed that the two classes performed comparably on the pretest, but the class that had received instruction uh, showed significant gains on the post-test, and the other class didn't. So as I mentioned, this study, uh, like the rest of the collection that I ended up analyzing, didn't look at transfer from EAP instruction to other courses, but instead looked at transfer across activities. In this case, from teaching activities to a testing activity. Initially, I was concerned about how relevant it would be to analyze these studies, given that the transfer that we are most interested in in EAP education is transfer to other courses. But I realized that the boundaries between courses are not all the same. For example, in some cases, an EAP course and another course will be quite different occurring at different times, in different places, with different people, and involving different subject matter. But in other cases, an EAP, an EAP course and another course will be relatively similar, occurring close together in time, perhaps in the same building or classroom, taught perhaps by the same teacher, and taken by many of the same students, and involving similar subject matter. And in many cases, there will be a combination of similarities and differences. So with that in mind, if we want a clearer picture of transfer in EAP education, it's not enough to just look at transfer to students' other courses, because that doesn't actually tell us much about the specific circumstances of transfer. We need to also be looking at transfer in much more detail across activities that differ in varying ways. And the picture we get of transfer across activities should, in turn, help us to understand where transfer may or may not be expected across different kinds of course boundaries. So with that in mind, um, in fall 2012, it's going back a, a few months, I gathered a collection of studies that showed, that showed transfer of EAP learning across activities. And I analyzed them with the transfer taxonomy. Um, I used the ERIC uh, online database to search for suitable studies. And my main criteria were that the studies, one, were conducted in an EAP setting, at an elementary school, secondary school, or post-secondary school level. Two, they used experimental or quasi-experimental research, uh, research design, and they showed that instruction had led to learning that students could demonstrate. In other words, there was evidence of transfer. Three, they were published in a peer-reviewed journal or book. Four, they provided enough detail about the research design that they could be analyzed with the transfer taxonomy. So taking all that into account, I ended up with 41 studies to look at. Uh, then I just read through each study looking for details related to each of those nine dimensions of the transfer taxonomy. Um, for example, in the EAP study I described a couple of slides back, um, which had examined uh, the impact of six hours of instruction on strategies for making appropriate requests in academic contexts, 
I found the following details. First, this transfer, the transfer in that study, involved knowledge of a request strategy. So that's a relatively general kind of learning. Second, the transfer involved performance on a discourse completion test, which required the students to state what they would uh, say in a hypothetical situation, like, uh, you want to make an appointment with your instructor to ask about your grade on an assignment. How would you ask? And then they had to write their response, uh, write a question that they would ask. And their responses were rated for appropriateness. So in terms of performance change, the transfer that occurred in this study involved an improvement in the quality of the student's work. Third, this transfer occurred on a discourse completion test that gave students scenarios and asked them what they would say, as I just described. Uh, the students weren't given any choices to choose from. It was an open-ended question, and the students had to write out what they would say in that situation. That kind of activity places relatively more demand on someone's memory than, for example, a multiple-choice type activity. As for the other six dimensions that looked at transfer distance, the transfer in this study was near for knowledge domain because the teaching and testing activities both dealt with everyday subject matter for, uh, for students on a campus. It was near for physical context because the teaching and testing activities were both part of an existing EAP course involving the same people and in the same place. It was near for temporal context because the testing activities occurred right after the teaching activities. It was near for functional context because the teaching and testing activities were part of an existing EAP course. So the students likely saw them both as having an academic purpose. Um, it was far for social context because the teaching activities were mainly collaborative, but the testing activities were done individually. And it was near for modality because teaching and testing activities were both open-ended, involving thinking about hypothetical scenarios and coming up with appropriate things to say. So I did the same thing for each of the 41 studies, and then I looked for patterns across them. Um, I created a couple of tables uh, to show all 41 studies and all nine dimensions uh, of the, uh, the trans transfer taxonomy with all this data. Um, it's a bit too much detail to go over in a, in a short session like this. So what I'm going to do is actually summarize um, things uh, more concisely here. But again, uh, if you want to take a closer look, send me an email or take a look at this when it comes out uh, as an article. Uh, the tables are included in that article. Um, so I'll just summarize the patterns that emerged. For the first three dimensions of the transfer taxonomy, dealing with the kind of transfer that occurred, this is how things looked across those 41 studies. Uh, 20 studies involved transfer that was specific, like pronunciation and word knowledge. 23 studies involved transfer that was general, like grammar rules and reading and writing skills and strategies. Um, those numbers don't add up to 41 because uh, some of the studies uh, had multiple dimensions to their research designs, so they could fit into both categories or you know, multiple categories. In any case, for the first one, uh, looking at specificity, it's relatively balanced. 20, 20 studies general, uh, sorry, specific, 23 studies general. It's relatively balanced. Uh, the next one, the second bullet, in 39 studies, almost all of them, Transfer involved improved accuracy or quality of the student's work. And in only four studies did transfer involve increased speed of the student's work or just a different approach in the way that students were doing their work. Um, for example, one of the studies looked at uh, whether teaching the students to use uh, certain kind of discourse markers led to the students actually using those discourse markers in their work. They weren't scored for accuracy or anything. It was just, do they change the way that they're actually writing and use these discourse markers? That's an example of a, a study that fits into the category of just a, a change in strategy, not necessarily accuracy or speed. In any case, that second bullet, relatively imbalanced. There's much more emphasis on transfer, uh, much more evidence of transfer in the form of improved accuracy or quality, not speed and uh, just simple approach. Uh, the third bullet, in 20 studies, transfer involved relatively low memory demands. And again, that's, uh, for example, uh, you know, testing activities involved like multiple choice tests where students could just choose their answers to things. 
Uh, 33 studies, in 33 studies, transfer involved relatively high transfer demands. For example, typically they would have like some sort of open-ended question that they had to answer. So there are fewer hints in terms of what they're supposed to be doing, uh, what they're supposed to be transferring. I see that also as fairly balanced. And for the six dimensions of the taxonomy dealing with transfer distance, this is how things looked. Um, across the collection of all 41 studies, far transfer occurred the most with modality in about half of the studies. And, um, and again, modality is looking at the, the kinds of uh, um, uh, activities that students are learning in and transferring to. You know, are they doing essays, uh, you know, multiple choice questions, things like that. That's modality. Um, but far transfer was much less common with the other dimensions. And it didn't occur at all with the functional context. Transfer in terms of functional context was always near. Right? The teaching activities and the transfer activities were always, they always had the same functional context. And looking at each study by itself, in any individual study, the number of dimensions on which transfer was far tended to be small. In almost one-fifth, in about 20% of the studies, transfer was not far on any dimensions. And in most of the other studies, transfer was, it was far on only one or two dimensions. And the maximum number of dimensions on which transfer was far was four. None of them had far transfer on six dimensions. In other words, there was not a lot of far transfer uh, in, across this collection of 41 studies. So what do these findings mean? Uh, first, they show not only that instruction can result in transfer with EAP students, but that such transfer can involve various learning outcomes, including those that are relatively specific, like pronunciation and knowledge of words, as well as those that are more general, like knowledge of grammar rules and reading and writing skills and strategies. So that's good. Second, transfer can have a positive impact on the quality and accuracy of students' work. Also good. But it's, le it's less certain that such transfer can influence the speed of students' work or the way students approach their work. I think we're also interested in those kinds of things, so here's an area where more, some more research is needed. Third, transfer can occur when students have relatively little demand placed on their memories. Right? They're dealing with multiple choice tests and things like that. Um, but it also can occur when greater demands are placed on their memories. In a lot of these studies, that was seen through open-ended test items. Um, but it's, it's a positive thing because that's relatively spontaneous transfer. And uh, that's something that we will certainly be looking for in a lot of situations in EAP education. We want to see spontaneous transfer, not just transfer that's you know, prompted by, um, by the transfer uh, context. And finally, transfer can occur across varying distances. In other words, when learning and transfer situations appear to be very similar, but also when learning and transfer situations may differ in one or more key ways. So this application of the transfer taxonomy, therefore, has revealed uh, much about what's possible for transfer in EAP education. And to wrap up, some implications. In terms of implications, these findings point to questions that can be addressed in future empirical research. For example, whether EAP students transfer general knowledge farther than specific knowledge. That's one thing that uh, theory would suggest. We need some empirical research to see if that's what actually happens. Uh, or whether they transfer learning when the, distance, when the transfer distance is far on not just one or two of the taxonomy's dimensions, which is what we saw in a lot of the studies uh, analyzed here, but if, if the distance is far on most or all of those dimensions, will we still see transfer? From the, this collection of research, we don't know. We have to do some more. Um, these findings point to pedagogical suggestions, too. For example, to build on the prevalence of near transfer, which we saw in these findings, um, uh, an implication of that is that we can design EAP instruction to be similar to students' other courses in as many ways as possible. We can see from, these, from this collection of research that near transfer happens quite a bit. 
uh, the, the 41 studies included a sample of, of about over 2,500 students in all these different EAP contexts. And near transfer was happening in all of these studies. So with that in mind, as educators, we can try to design our courses to be as similar as possible to target contexts. And we stand a pretty good chance of seeing some, some near transfer. Um, but another implication is that we should uh, be cautious about expecting transfer when EAP instruction differs from target contexts in numerous ways. It's, it's just unclear from the, from the collection of research that we have available to us now whether that will actually happen. It may happen. We may see far transfer from EAP instruction, but it's just not clear yet from the research that we have available if, if we can expect to see that happen. Uh, as for limitations of this investigation, although the collection of studies was chosen uh, systematically, it's possible that some potentially relevant studies were missed. Uh, also, the use of two or three categories for each of those nine dimensions, for example, uh, for, the, for the transfer distance dimensions, there were only two categories, near and far. Right? So there were only two or three categories for each of the nine dimensions. Um, uh, it, that's consistent with the way the taxonomy was originally used by its developers, but such an approach does mean that some detail inevitably gets left out, gets set aside. But despite these and other uh, related limitations, I think the investigation um, has helped to shed some useful light on, uh, on this topic, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, research is going to build on uh, the patterns that we see here um, and some of the questions that I just outlined. Um, so... That's about it from me. Uh, thank you again, and uh, I'll put this slide back up. Um, so if you are interested in uh, taking a look at the slides again and, or listening to the recording, it will be available in a couple of days on that website. And if you have any uh, questions that don't get answered in the next 10 minutes, um, please feel free to email me. And now we just have some questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Please, yeah. Okay. Because some of what the examples were sounded like assessment of learning yes. within a within a course. So is it is it sort of you think you transfer the use of spectrum, right? And so yeah. basically evaluation of students within a course is on that spectrum of transfer as long as it's a different activity. And the further you go out, the less we know. I think that's a good, that's a good way. I, I don't know if I could say it much better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, there's there's been um, some interesting discussions about the definition of transfer in in the scholarly literature on learning and transfer. Some so so there's not universal agreement about this. Um, some of some of the experts in this area have pointed a few of them have pointed out that there's kind of a fuzzy line between learning and transfer. Um, but the way you, you said that you know it's, it, there's sort of a spectrum here fits with the way that I look at this, um, and uh, and I've seen it described by other researchers in that way as well that that you can take any performance of of of, our, of an ability or knowledge or something like you can take any performance and uh, and plot it on a scale in terms of how, how different it is from the original learning situations. And, you know, sometimes we, we might ask someone to do something in an almost identical situation. Like I might teach someone how to use a word processing program on the computer and then say, now you try. And then they do it. I mean, this, it's, it's still an example of learning and, it's, and transfer, but it's, a, it's, it's just an identical, almost identical situation. So it's, it's, it's not of as much interest as the situations where someone is having to apply learning in increasingly different situations. Um, but, but uh, yeah, there's some interesting discussion. And, you know, and as some have pointed out, uh, there's, never an there's never a completely identical situation just because of time. So you, know, you learn something. If you, if you have to use it somehow afterwards, time has changed. And so there always is some difference. But I don't know how interesting those very, very similar situations are to us. That said, we, we still don't always see transfer even to very similar situations. You know, we, we still, I mean, we, we, we might assume that that's going to happen. We might have even stronger assumptions about that happening, but we still don't see it happening all the time. So even those, we, we want to understand what's happening. But it's the far ones where there's even more interesting things happening. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Transferring is just meaning 
acquiring information and retaining it? Uh, I think... Uh, so it's kind of the same in some ways, but different. I think an important, an important uh, part of the way that uh, I look at this and that I, I see it commonly looked at is, is the idea of application. Right? So... Um, you know, the idea that we're, we're learning things and then we're making use of them. And I mean, I also try to be careful. It, it might sound, you know, when, when we try to simplify things for a presentation or for, you know, uh, writing about them in articles and books, there's a risk that we make things sound a little bit too linear and too simple. And, you know, that's, that's part of uh, what can happen with transfer. The idea, you learn something and then you go and apply it. I mean, it sounds really linear, right? And, and things are more can often be a lot more complicated than that. Um, Diane Larson Freeman was talking about that this morning in her presentation. Um, some of the things she was talking about applied directly to this. She didn't use the label transfer, but she was talking about um, adaptation, um, uh, the problem of, of inert knowledge. I mean, that's all transfer, but just with different labels. Um, and, she, and part of her point was that uh, these things are complex. Right, that that the idea of learning and transfer—it's not this, not necessarily this simple one-step, two-step process. Um, so yeah, uh, but I think I think the way that uh, yeah, the the idea of, of thinking about things in terms of ap application, I, I think helps, um, especially when we're trying to uh, think about how transfer can be different from learning. You know, learning. Um, yeah. And then, then having, and then trying in, in different ways to make use of what, whatever it is that we know. But it's, it's complicated. <laughs> there was a hand up over here, too. No? No, okay. Please. Yeah. Actually, I have a question about the analysis or maybe methodology. Yeah, please. Because, like, I think when you use a method like this, mm. you can only analyze what's present, like what exists. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Oh boy, that's a good question. Yeah, because you can only analyze what's available. Um, you know, I, I haven't, I didn't, I didn't really look at the collection of forty-one studies from that perspective. Now you're, now you're making me want to go back and have a look at them. Um, but there, there will be gaps, of course. I mean, it's only forty-one studies, and uh, EAP education. You know, we're trying to accomplish a lot of stuff, right? We're trying to teach all sorts of things. Um, Yes. A lot of Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, one of the reviewers. So this is going to this is going to appear in uh, the Journal of English for Academic Purposes. It's it's actually available now, but uh, it's scheduled for June. Um, and one of the reviewers uh, for the Journal of English for Academic Purposes made the same point, and said, you know, why are you not including studies that don't show transfer, right? Because there's research. You know, I mean. Besides the fact that it's sometimes hard to get published if you don't have a positive result in your experimental finding, but there are things available. There are studies available that I could uh, have included that don't show transfer. Um, that actually wouldn't have worked. So I, I acknowledge that that's that's important, but not not with this particular study because um, with, in this case I wanted to look at the research that does show transfer, and just to try to bring out some details. So this, th th there's no claim here about, um, you know, uh, the, sort of, the sort of balance in terms of, you know, when we can expect to transfer in EAP education and when we might not expect transfer in EAP, EAP education. Is it going to happen all the time or is it going to happen, how, how much of the time is it going to happen? Um, that, that didn't really fit with the main question for this particular study. Uh, but it's but it's a good question, and I think it'll it'll fit in into this kind of research uh, somewhere. Yeah, looking at why things don't, why learning doesn't transfer. Absolutely, yeah. Please. So that might be where your studies about far situations are, right? If there was such a similarity that these were all like near and yeah. they had results. Right, right. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So that, that might be the next. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because in, the, in this collection of 41 studies, um, it's mainly near transfer. 
Um, so the research that might have been designed in a way that the learning tasks and the transfer, and the transfer tasks were more different, they may not, not have got the positive results. They may not have produced results that showed transfer. They haven't been published. We don't get to, we don't get to analyze them, which is, which is okay. I mean, again, we're looking at what we can learn from the existing research. Um, but yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, so more research that explicitly looks for far transfer, and let's, and let's see what happens. Yeah. Please. Um, I understand the, the benefit of using the transfer taxonomy, but um, the populations that were analyzed in this, um, were these all academic students? I mean, were they, were they all college students? So mm -hmm. K-12 and... Yeah. So I think you did say that. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and that, and that was another question that came up from the reviewers. So, I mean, it has to do with the definition of EAP. I chose to use a broad definition. Um, so these were all students who were in or were just about to go into an English medium academic setting, which included, I, I didn't go as low as the very early elementary school grades. I, I included studies, and, and it was a handful of studies at the elementary school and secondary school level. Most of them were college and university. Um, and yeah, uh, I included those. And again, with, with, with more, with more, with a larger collection, you'd be able to tease some of these things apart. With small numbers of studies, it's 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 tricky. And um, yeah, but that but that's, that raises a question for uh, uh, for building on this. You know, can we see any differences if we separate levels? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been doing research on learning transfer. Uh, as a, just this topic for probably about 15 years. Uh, this study um, is, I, it, it seemed like a, a good time to do a systematic review of research using this transfer taxonomy as a foundation for a few new directions to, to build on some of the earlier stuff. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I think we're... Two minutes over. Thanks, everybody. And um, yeah, uh, if you have any other questions, please email me.